18. North could not move, could not even breathe. It felt as if a giant hand had taken hold of him and sought to crush his entire body to a tiny pulp. In some ways, he welcomed it, for with his death would at least end his guilt. No one else would die because he had sought to rob a tomb and instead unearthed a nightmare. Then, just as he prepared himself to die, a tremendous force threw him upward. Nork flew hard, almost as if he had been fired off by a catapult. So, instead of a crushing death, he would eventually fall to his doom. Unlike the short drop aboard the Hawk's Fire, Nork felt certain that this time he would not survive. But something, no, someone, caught him by one arm, slowing his flight. Nork tried to see who it might be, but turning his head toward his would-be rescuer brought about an overwhelming sensation of vertigo. He lost all sense of direction, no longer even able to tell up from down. Without warning, Nork struck the ground, the sand doing very little to prevent the jolt from knocking him nearly senseless. For some time, the battered veteran lay there, cursing the fact that he had seemed to end up in such a position more often than necessary. His body ached to his bones, and his vision revealed nothing to him but blurs. Yet, despite all that, he at least felt less pain. Whatever spell Galena had cast before her death had at some point ceased, and with it had also gone the crushing suffocation. He heard thunder and knew from the general grayness his unfocused eyes could make out that he returned to the storm-swept desert near Luke Golane. Norg also sensed that he had not come here alone, that even now someone stood over him. Can you stand? A familiar female voice asked gently. He forced himself up as best as he could to a sitting position. Doing so made his head spin, but at least Nork felt some pride in accomplishing the simple task by himself. His vision finally cleared enough for him to see who had spoken. It proved to be the dark-haired woman he had not only seen just before the walls had closed in, but also now recalled as one of the faces on the statues he had passed during his second sojourn in the dream version of Horizon's tomb. Horizon, thinking of Bartek's brother, made him recall who had been seen standing near the pale woman. Horizon, still alive after centuries. She mistook his momentary shaking as a part of possible injury. Be careful, you've been through much. We do not know how it may have affected you. Who are you? My name is Kara Nightshadow, she replied, kneeling so as to get a better look at his face. One slim hand gently touched his cheek. Does that hurt you? In truth, her hand felt good, but he knew better than to tell her so. No. Are you a healer? Not exactly. I'm a follower of Rathma. A necromancer. Surprisingly, the admission did not shock him as much as it might once have Everything around Nork of late had concerned death, or worse. A necromancer certainly fit well into the pattern, although he had to admit he had never seen an attractive one before. The few others of her faith that had come across had been dour figures little different from the dead with whom they communed. He realized that although she had told him her name, he had not introduced himself. My name's Nork. Yes, Nork Vizaran. I know. 
How? He recalled that she had used his name earlier, if the two had never actually met as far as he knew. Certainly he would have remembered. I've been hunting for you ever since you left Bartok's tomb with the armor. You? But why? She leaned back, apparently satisfied that he had not suffered much from their austere from Horizon's bizarre domain. Along with the Vajerai, my people took the responsibility for hiding the warlord's ensconced remains. We could not destroy either the body or the armor at that time, but we could keep them from those who might find a use, either corrupted mages or deadly demons. Norco remembered the monstrous creature in the sea. Why demons? Bartuk started out as a pawn of theirs, but even you must know that by the time of his death, even the Lords of Hell looked in awe at his power. Although only a portion of his total might were remains and the armor itself would be enough to entirely upset the delicate balance of life and death in the world. And even perhaps beyond. After all that he'd seen, he had little trouble believing her. Nork struggled to his feet. Kara assisting him. He looked down at her, thinking back to what had just happened. You saved me. She looked away, almost seeming embarrassed. I had some part in it. I would have died otherwise, right? Very likely. Then you saved me. Why did you do it? Why not simply let me die? If I had, the armor would have been left with no host. It would have been powerless. Kara stared him in the eyes. You did not choose to wear Bartok's accursed armor in North Vizarin. It shows you. Although I do not know why, whatever it has done, whatever foul deeds it has performed, I felt you innocent of them, and therefore deserving of a chance of life. But more might die because of that. The bittern must, must have shown in his expression, for the necromancer withdrew slightly. My friends, the men of the inn, the Hawkscar crew, and now that witch, how many more must perish? And most before my eyes? She put a hand on his own. Nork feared for her, but the suit did nothing. Perhaps whatever fueled its evil task lay dormant for a time, or perhaps it simply awaited the best moment to strike. There is a way to end this, Kara replied. We must remove the armor. Nork burst out in laughing. He laughed long and hard, and with no hope. Woman, don't you think I've tried? Don't you think the first chance I had, I pulled both gloves, attempted to peel off every bit of plate? I couldn't even remove the damn boots. They're all sealed to my body, as if a part of my very flesh. The only way you'll be able to remove the suit is if you take my skin with it. I understand the trouble. I understand also that, under most circumstances, no spellcaster would have the power to undo what the armor has done. Then what can you possibly hope to accomplish? The frustrated soldier snapped. You should have let me die just now. It would have been better for all. Despite his outburst, the raven-haired women remained calm. She glanced around before answering, as if looking for someone or something. He did not follow. I should have known. Who? Horizon? Card nodded. So, you recognized him too? 
Exhaling, Nork explained. My memories. My memories are confused. Some of them I know are mine. But others? He hesitated, certain that she would find him mad for what he believed. The others belong to Bartek, I think. Yes. Very likely they did. That doesn't surprise you? In legend, the warlord and his crimson suit seemed as one. Over time, he imbued it with one mighty enchantment after another, transforming it into more than simply pieces of metal. By the time of his death, it had been said that the armor acted as a, a loyal dog, its own magical protecting the fighting for Bartek as hard as he himself would. Small wonder that his life has been imprinted upon it, and that some of those vile memories have seeped into your own mind. The weary veteran shuddered, and the longer I wear it, the more I succumb. There's been times that I actually thought I was Bartok. Which is why we must remove it, she frowned. We must try to convince Horizon to do it. I feel he's the only one who has the capability. Nork did not exactly like that notion. The last time he and the bearded elder had seen one another, the armor had reacted instantly and with clear malice. That may stir up the suit again. They may even be why it's being so quiet now. Something suddenly struck him. It wants him. It wants Horizon. All this damn distance, all the things it's put me through, it's all because it wants to slay Bartek's brother. Her expression indicated that she had come to much the same conclusion. Yes. Blood calls the blood, as they say. Even if the blood between two is bad. Horizon helped slay his brother at the Battle of Bizjun. And the armor must have preserved that memory within it. Now, after all this time, it has risen and seeks to repay the deed. Even though Horizon should have been dead centuries ago. But he isn't. Blood calls the blood, you said. It must have known he was still alive. Nork shook his head, which doesn't explain why it waited so long. God! It's all, it's all insane. Card took him by the arm. Horizon must have the answer. Somehow, we must find our way back to him. I feel that he's our only hope by which we could put an end to the Warlord's curse. Put an end to this. Someone says. Rasped the voice of no human orange. No. No. This one desires otherwise. He does. Car stared past Nork, who immediately began to turn. Look! It was as far as the necromancer got. We resembled a sharp needle like lance darted down toward him. It would have caught Nork through the head, but at last Car pushed him aside. Unfortunately for both of them, the wicked lance continued its downward thrust unabated and buried itself in the woman's chest. The lance quickly withdrew. Carter gasped, collapsing. Blood spilled over her blouse. Nork froze momentarily. Then, knowing he could do nothing for her, he too perished. The variant fighter turned to confront their attacker. Yet, what greeted his horrified eyes proved to be no warrior, but rather a thing born of nightmares. It must resemble a towering insect. But one clearly spawned in more hellish climbs. Pulsating veins crisscrossed its grotesque form. What he had taken for a lance? 
had actually been one of the creature's own appendages. A lengthy, sickle-like arm ending in a deadly point. Beneath the sickle's savage, skeletal hands with claws opened and closed. Somehow the massive horror managed to support itself on two lengthy hind limbs bent back in the manner of the mantis it so resembled. This one came in search of a treacherous, wandering witch, but such a prize will serve better. Long as this one hunted for you, for the power you wield. Even Dazed Nork knew that the demon, for what other creature could this be, meant the armor, not the man. You killed her, he managed to reply. Blood dripping from one sickle, the mantis dipped his head. One less mortal makes no difference. Where is the witch? Where is Galena? He knew her? Nor did not find that at all surprising. Even half under the spell of the armor, he had known that much of her story had been lies. Dead. The armor killed her. An intake of breath indicated to him that the demon found this startling. <gasps> Is she dead? Of course. This one sensed something amiss. But did not suspect that. He began to emit a peculiar rattling noise, which the soldier at first thought anger. Only after a time, however, did it become clear that the monstrous insect laughed. The bond is severed. Yet still, this one roams the mortal plane. The tie is broken, but the blood spill preserves. This one could have slain her all along. What a fool Zazax has been. Nork took the demon's enjoyment as a chance to look at Kara. Her entire chest had turned crimson, and from where he stood, he could not tell if she even breathed. It pained him to have her, the one who saved him, die before his very eyes without being able to do anything about it. Spurred on by anger, Nork took a step toward the mantis, or at least tried to do so. Unfortunately, his legs and his entire body refused to obey him. Damn you! He roared at the suit. Not now! Zezek sees laughing. The deep yellow orbs fixed on the helpless human. Fool! Think you to command the greatness of Bartok. This one thought to peel the armor off your cold corpse. But now Zazak see this would have proven to be a terrible blunder. You are needed, at least for the time being. The mantis raised one spear-like tip toward the breastplate. Immediately Nork's left hand reached out, but not in defense. Instead, to his horror, it touched the demon's own appendage. As if an acknowledgement. You would be whole, would you not? Zezek asked of the suit. You would desire the return of the helm. Separated from you so long ago. This one can take you to it. If you like. In response, one booted foot stepped forward. Even Norik knew what the lawn movement meant. Then we shall go. But it must be done quickly. The mantis turned and started off. Nork had no choice but to follow. The armor soon marching alongside the demon. Behind the desperate soldier, Kara bled away the last drops of her life.
but he could do no more for her than he could do for himself. In some ways, Nork envied the Pale Woman. The necromancer's suffering had already been all ended. His would only get worse. His last hope had been crushed. Heaven help me. The mantis apparently had sharp hearing, for he immediately fell upon the hopeless words. Heaven! No angel will be there to help you, fool of a human. Too afraid they are. Too cowardly. We walk the world in numbers. The demon master awakes, and the human stronghold of Luke Lane prepares to suffer a horrific end. Heaven? You would do better to pay to hell. And as they continued on toward their destination, Nora could not help but think that on this, the demon might just speak the truth. Kara felt her life ebbing away, but she could do nothing about it. The demonic creature she had seen moved with inhuman swiftness. Perhaps she had saved Nork, but even that the necromancer doubted. She drifted along. Each drop of blood leaving her body, bringing her close to taking her next step in the overall scheme of the balance. Yet, despite her deep beliefs, Kara wanted nothing more at the moment than to return to the moral plane. She had left too much undone. Had left Nork in a position that he could not possibly survive without her aid. Worse, demons walked her world. Further evidence that every follower of Rathma was badly needed. She had to return. But such choices were generally not given to the dying. What should we do? A voice in the distance asked. A voice that Kara felt she knew. He said that we should give it back. When we felt we must, I feel we must, but without, we will still have time, Satan. He may have said so, but I don't trust him. A brief throaty chuckle. <laughs> Trust you to be the only one capable of not trusting one of his grand kind. Save the remarks. It's got to be done. Let's do it. As you say. Car suddenly felt a great weight upon her chest. A weight that felt so good that she eagerly welcomed it. Took it into her very being. It had a tremendous familiarity to it that caused her to reminisce about little things such as her mother feeding her fruit, a butterfly, the color of rainbows landing on her knee while she studied in the forest, the smell of Captain Geronin's freshly cooked meals, even a brief glimpse of Nork Viserin's weathered but not so unhandsome face. The necromancer suddenly gasped <gasps> as life enfolded her again. She blinked, feeling the sand, the wind. Thunder rumbled, and somewhere distant she heard was seen the sounds of battle. It did, as he said it, it would. I should have used it. On myself. Car knew that voice now, although it changed for some few seconds before. Now it sounded more as she would have expected it to sound. 
The rasping words of a dead man. I know. I know. Saying Trist retorted with some silent response. Only her. Opening her eyes, the enchanter stared up at the solemn forms of the grinning Revan and his Jerai companion. What? How did you find me? We never lost you. We let you go and followed. His eyes narrowed. But here in Aranak, we knew you were around, but could not see you until now. They did not know exactly where she had gone when Horizon had led her down into this underground sanctum. The spell binding her to them had kept them in the general area, but both the sanctuary's location and its incredible magic had left the revenants baffled. She could have been directly underneath, and neither would have noticed. Her strength returning, the dark mage tried to push herself up a bit. Something slid from her chest. Kara instinctively caught it with one hand and marveled. Her dagger! Her strength returning, the dark mage tried to push herself up a bit. Something slid from her chest. Kara instinctively caught it. Triss' smile had taken a decidedly bitter turn. The bond is broken. The life force we took is yours. He looked frustrated. We have no more hold over you. The necromancer looked down at her chest. Blood covered most of her blast, but the horrible wound inflicted on her by the demon had sealed over. The only sign of its earlier presence, a circular mark, as if someone had tattooed Kara there. Looks much healed. She covered the area up again, glaring at the undead despite the fact that he and Fawton had just gifted her with a second chance at life. How did you just do that? I've never heard of such a feat. The wiry corpse shrugged, his head tipping to the other side. He, my friend, said that the dagger was a part of you. When you were bound to us, some part of you came with. We returned it to make you alive. He grimaced as best as he could. Nothing keeps you tied to us anymore. Except one thing. Norik. Kara forced herself up. Triss stood back. But to her astonishment, Fotson lent a hand. She hesitated at first, but realized that the Revenant only meant to help. Thank you. Watson blinked, then rewarded her with a brief, tight-lipped smile. You bring life to the deadest of the dead now. Or even... St. suggested. What about Norik? We think he nears Luke Elaine. Even though they had saved her, the necromancer could not let them slay their formal friend. Nork's not responsible for your deaths. What happened to you, he could not prevent. The two stared back at her. At last, Fawcett blinked again, and Triss replied, We know. But then why? Car stopped. All along, she assumed that they hunted their murderer who naturally could only be Nork. Only now, looking at the duo, did she understand that her misconceptions had led her astray. You do not pursue Nork in order to exact revenge on him. 
you pursue Bartek's armor. Although they did not answer, she knew that she had not been wrong. You could have told me. Trish did not reply to that either. Instead of abruptly announcing to Kara, The city is under siege. Under siege? When did that happen? By a who? One who also seeks to raise the dead. Or at least the bloody specter of Bartok. Where did all these madmen come from, Carl wondered. And that made her think of the ragged figure from whom she had most recently escaped. Turning around, she looked for some sign of the arcane sanctuary, but to no avail. The desert sands swirled in the wind, the dunes looking as if they had remained untouched for years. Yes, somewhere around here, the earth had opened up and deposited her and Norik on the ground. Not caring what the revenants might make of her peculiar actions, Carr called out, Horizon, listen to me. You gotta help us. And we can help you. Help us save Norik and put an end to Bartok's legacy. She waited. The wind whipping her hair and sand stinging her face. Car waited for Horizon to materialize or at least send her some sign that he listened. But nothing happened. At last, St. Trist broke the silence. We can't wait here any longer. While you call more ghosts. I'm not calling. The necromancer stopped. Of what use to explain to the revenants that Horizon had survived the centuries and lived, albeit as a madman under their fairy feet. For that matter, why had she even hoped that Bartok's brother would join with him in this dire venture? He had already shown that if it had been up to him alone, Nork would have perished along with the armor. Some legends concerning Horizon had painted him as a hero in comparison to his brother. But the same hero had also summoned demons, bending them to his will. Yes, his war against Bartok had definitely been about self-preservation as much as anything else. There would be no aid from the ancient Bajerai. We go, Trist added. You come or not. Your choice, Necromancer. What else could Kara do? Even without Horizon, she had to go after Nork. The demon must have taken him to the one besieging Luke Lane. But for what reason? Did they hope to destroy what remained of the veteran fighter's own mind, enabling the ghostly memories of the Warlord of Blood to completely take over? A terrifying thought for all people everywhere, not simply poor Nork. Many scholars had assumed, quite rightly, that had he defeated his brother, Bartuk would have wreaked his evil upon the rest of the world until it had all fallen under his heel. Now it seemed like Kara, he had a second chance to succeed. As a follower of Rathma, she could not permit that, even if it meant having to kill the armor's host. The thought left her cold. Does the balance, after all, required Norik to be slain? Then so be it. Even her own life did not matter if it only meant that she put an end to the danger. I will come with you. The necromancer finally replied. Flotsam nodded, then pointed in the direction of Luke Elaine. Time is wasting, he says. The revenants flanked Kara as the trio set off, a fact which did not escape her. The wind had already wiped clean much of Norg's trail, but Trist and the Vajerai had no apparent trouble following. The bond to what 
had murdered them and enabled the pair to follow anywhere, any place. What about the demon? Kara asked. He had designs. On the armor, too, and would certainly fight anyone who sought to take it away from him. Triss pointed at her dagger, which now hung from the Dark Mage's belt. That is our best bet. How? Just use it and pray. He looked as if he intended to say more, but Fotson gave him a glance that silenced the smaller of the ghouls immediately. What secret did they hold from her? Had she underestimated them? Did they still plan to use her for a puppet? Now was certainly not the time to hold back anything that might mean the difference between victory and death. What do you... We'll deal with the armor, Satan commented, cutting her off. And Norik. His tone indicated that there would be no further conversation on this or any other subject. Carr considered trying anyway, but decided not to aggravate relations with the duo. The Revenants acted in no manner she could readily predict, going against everything she had been taught about their kind. Half the time they acted as if they still had hearts that pumped, blood that flowed. The rest of the time they moved on with the silent determination for which such undead had been fabled. Truly a unique situation. But then, everything about this matter had been unique. Deadly too. She pictured Norik in her mind. Wondering what he must be going through at the moment. The image of the demon overshadowed the fighter, causing the necromancer to bite her lip in concern. There also appeared in her mind the shadow of a third figure, the one who now led the assault on the coastal kingdom. What part did he play? What did he gain in all this? He could not simply desire to have Nork become a second Bartok. That would be the same as signing his own death warrant. Bartok had never either willingly served nor allied himself with any other mortal. She would have the chance to discover the answers to her many questions soon enough as to whether she would live long enough to appreciate those answers. Kara had severe doubts.